I'm your host, Dracos, joined by Yamato Cannon and none other than Fanatics Reckless. We're available on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, really anywhere you get your podcast whatsoever, SoundCloud, and your weirdchantpodcast.com. Um, all totally viable options. Today on this episode, we're going to be doing a quick recap of the top four in the LEC to looking at the 80 carries in Europe. You've heard what we have to say. Let's hear what Reckless has to say. And of course, we're going to be talking a lot about Reckless. Not in the sense as much of League of Legends, but more about the man behind the player, the man that is the player, however you want to phrase it, we're going to be talking about Reckless. Okay, so before we get into the meat of today's discussion, everything about Reckless you've ever wanted to know, um, I want to talk a little bit about the state of the league right now. I feel like I, I left. I wasn't here last weekend. I didn't watch the most of the games live, especially on Saturday. I come back, and suddenly we've G2 is like, falling down misfits are suddenly everything at the top four teams are tied for first i kind of wanted to get both of your takes on this you missed the greatness man i know it was good i'm at 2-0 i've been catching up zach <laughs> zach i know what is this okay there's like there's a lot for me to unpack here because when you just look at the scoreboards and you like two times speed through the vods it's hard to appreciate the nuances so fanatic g2 misfits og all tied at the top um i the league is in a wild wild state what's your what's your take on like the league as a whole right now reckless um, I would say even though we're all together like that, there's still a clear difference between every team, not in terms of skill or anything. It's just everyone has like their own very specific idea of how to make things work. And I think you could see it very, very like clearly versus us and OG, for example, where we knew kind of exactly what they wanted to do and we made a very specific plan for it. And uh, I think a lot of teams are kind of trying to do the same thing against G2, where they also have like a very clear idea of how they want to play and people are trying their absolute hardest to counter it. So even though we're all at the same level, I would say, of skill, it's like we have a very different idea of what that skill is. Mm. I would, uh, you know, like just to reference to the game between you guys and OG, I thought you guys just went full draft kingdom this weekend. Like yeah, we did. <laughs> Bipo in PGL said that Giroto was very dizzy and I have to agree. Like when all OPs were open, uh, that Alfari was playing Soraka in the end was really a big question mark ping. And uh, I think you guys hot smurfed. And I'm, I'm super excited about that because at the beginning of the whole season, I was always saying, oh, this Fnatic is going to be super, super great. You know, this is for the long run. This is the Fnatic that will be very diverse. I think uh, this weekend was like, this is the time where I'm starting to get hyped about Fnatic. Mm. So that's uh, exciting okay. as a viewer. It looked good. I was impressed about how quickly you guys hit the ground running. And I'm also just like, in general, I mean, I love weird picks. So you guys, <laughs> you guys have just been, you're, you're giving me a little bit of everything. You're filling, you're filling in some gaps that other teams have been missing out on. And it's just, it's so interesting that everyone has that kind of unique strategy. And it feels like if everyone's trying to just play to what everyone else is trying to do, I think it's like the most interesting top four that you could probably hope for in that capacity. Mm. Cause like, if I look back to 2016, 2017 especially like G2 primetime era it was just like everyone trying to be G2 and everyone being slightly worse rather than yeah. like any team having their own individual identity back in the heyday where I feel like everyone was still in Europe just trying to copy Korea yeah. and go a little bit further except for like UOL right but like UOL were on their own planet of strategy you didn't <laughs> no, no one came out there to meet them it was it was it was unique um, so it's it's a little bit wild to me that we actually have such a close top four I think Misfits is pretty unique in the sense that uh, I think even though I'm not completely fully trusting their bot just yet, mm. I think a lot of people are taking that G2 game performance kind of out of proportion. I think the top side is really strong and I think uh, they've shown that the game can actually be played through top side while I think the majority of both LEC and the world uh, most of the time play through bottom, first Drake, swap to Herald. Yep. and kind of have like this step-by-step -step thing while Dan Dan and Denik, I mean, uh, Razor tend to also be able to play through top, which is, I think, that what makes them unique, mm -hmm. which is cool. When I like look across uh, a lot of these teams, you're bringing up bot lanes and Reckless, we've we've kind of talked a lot about like role density mm -hmm. uh, in Europe and we talked with Mickey last week about supports and the week before that we kind of just talked generally. But I was curious what you thought of the level of bot laners, AD carries, um, 
as you've been playing against in this entire season compared to past seasons and past years? Because from from an outside perspective, right, not actually playing lane phases against any of these guys, they destroy me. Um, they are all great. Uh, <laughs> like, it does feel like the overall level of specifically 80 carries is significantly higher this year. I would agree, yeah. I don't think there's anyone that's like a punching bag for the rest of us. I feel like everyone has very clear strengths mm. of what they want to do in the game. Obviously, some better, some worse, but... There's never a game where I feel like I just have such an edge on this guy that no matter what I do or no matter what I play, I'll end up on, on top. It's always like I have to actually focus in hard of yeah. what I want to play and in what, in what matchup I want to play it and how I want to play it until I can actually get my advantages. Dang. So it's a very different regular season for me. I don't have these weeks anymore where I feel like, oh, this is a chill week or mm. this is a tough week. It's like every week's a tough week or every game's a tough game. So. That's that's honestly brutal. Like I'm glad to hear that. Like that as a, as someone who just watches this league, who gets to spectate, who gets to commentate, that's like exactly what I want to hear. Is that everyone is good? That everyone the is dream. competitive? It's it is absolutely a dream. But that does sound really brutal. Like yeah, yeah, I, I won't name names, but there were years past where I was like, oh, this lane matchup, you're gonna be fine. This lane matchup, you're gonna be fine. Um, and that does feel like it, it just puts a lot more pressure on pretty much everyone on the bottom side of the map. Um, and it's interesting that you guys are talking about it being so bot lane focused because it just felt like last year was like mid lane just being so dis like mid lane is obviously always yeah. kind of the most important Akali Syndra yeah but it was <laughs> Akali Silas last year oh yeah Silas like no Sorry. other role mattered and Kai'Sa and Zaya were great and I actually miss those champions a lot uh, although we do still see a decent amount of Zaya um, but I'm glad that finally like we have a bit more attention and a bit more kind of power around the bottom lane in Europe because outside of G2 2v2 killing people or you and Hilla saying 2v2 killing people last year it just felt like Bahrain just was not that hype Sona, Sona Tamkens you didn't like it? Sona no. Tarek? Sona, no I didn't. Yumi? <laughs> you didn't like Yumi? <laughs> I thought my Garen was pretty clean. Okay, yeah. the Garen, the, to be fair, I forgot about the Garen. Why Why are always my teams the victim of like a new strategy taking over the whole game? Yeah, you say that you're a victim, but you also got that free win when G2 decided to play Garen top. So sure, that was like... Some, it's a double-edged sword, Yamato. Because it's like, you know, we, we were playing against this composition with the Garen Yumi, and then one point we realized, we're like, we have to engage on the Garen, and it's like, this doesn't work. It's like, you guys were getting prior 2v5, so yep. it, was, it was rough. And we killed you guys a couple of times. It was just, it blew my mind, that game. That game was, so that was the game where you popped off bot lane, right? Was that the yeah, yeah, it's bear? Like level one, yeah. we got kill, then we got another kill, and then it just didn't matter. <sighs> Wholesome. And but, Yumi's back. Isn't that great? Isn't everyone excited about yeah, that? I, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so toxic. I don't like playing with it, and I don't like playing against it, so I don't like it so much. He, she's, he, very different, uh, she's a very different support now. She's yeah. not the same poking kind of support now. She's much more of a like an ardent user, I feel like, where she yeah. sit, sits on top of you and presses E. I like that was very diplomatic to say brain dead. That was good. She was, you know, more of an ardent user. Yeah. She pushes E now. So the least like, skill uh, intensive of her Revealing Garan is not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't like it so much. And I think uh, it's a bit overhyped right now. I feel like uh, I see it being banned and like first picked in some of the games, but in other games it just like doesn't get banned and doesn't get picked. So yeah. I think it's like a very uncertain champion right now that um, some people are probably a bit overhyped about and some people don't even feel like it's viable so I, I get the impression that it's like it looks really good in the games that Ezreal would be really good anyway mm -hmm. so it's like it makes like usually Ezreal Yumi is the way we see it like yep. Rogue played it that one game mm -hmm. versus Misfits the one they, they beat the, broke, broke the win streak and that looked like really really brutal because the enemy just couldn't force and mm -hmm. then it looked good I guess Yumi right now doesn't want to ever leave anyone, doesn't bounce around like before. I don't you think that was mostly because of Pike though? Because I yeah, feel like they tried the, the Pike yeah. strategy and then they lost really hard 2v2. Yeah. Like, and they were like permanently trading sites as well, which might have then played a role into it. Yeah. But it was weird to see, for me at least, a lane where Yumi is supposed to struggle. Yeah. And then she's uh, she's pushing the enemy under the tower and they're like scared of getting dove and yeah. stuff so it's maybe a team problem where they are like too much playing towards topside like you mentioned earlier yeah. which is their main strength right yeah but also it's like you pick pike so you should adjust at that point or you should have like a plan at that point so maybe For it was sure. like they kind of just winged it maybe on stage and they were like okay let's play pike and roam that is kind of my impression yeah because like what are you just going to concede all pressure against the ezreal yumi lane because like once ezreal gets pushed you're not getting it back as mf right unless you like until it resets and what the hell is Pike gonna do once you start to lose that? Honestly, whole whole Misfits draft was really troll here. 
Like mis like misfortune set Gragas Pike Zoe. Just what what's the plan here? Yeah. You're gonna knock him one way, and then you're gonna pull him back the other way, and then you're gonna hook him this way, and then then just then once it's all lined up, so Carzy's gonna three, get the perfect MF ping fault, ping fault ping win ping. rookie of the split, and stop <laughs> me from doing whatever the hell we have to do for our bet punishment. Okay. That's the strategy right there. Nice. Um, honestly, guys, like we, league is in a is in a. I'm really excited about the league right now. I think it's in a really good state. Um. Reckless, before we dive into kind of you and your history, I was curious how you felt about your upcoming games this week. You're playing against the important one. Um, sorry, no disrespect to... Misfits and Schalke. Yeah, it's Misfits and Schalke. Thank you. I've got in from... <laughs> wow, you're really on top of that. Uh, the important one is Misfits. That's the one I was going to ask you about. The Schalke one I'm not as concerned about, although I do think NX is a good player. But how do you feel about the, the Misfits matchup? Um, from experience, usually the games where you feel like it's going to be hard, they're easy. And the games that you feel like are going to be easy, they're hard. So um, I'm more worried for the Schalke game. <laughs> uh, it's kind of tied into what I said earlier about like every bot lane being good. So for example, in games where we have supposedly been the better team, I feel like we've struggled a lot bot lane specifically. Yeah. Uh, it ha doesn't have anything to do with like skill disparity or anything. It's just the mindset you go into the game with is mm -hmm. very different when you play out against a team that you feel like, okay, this game can go either way or against a team like, okay, we should have this in the back no matter what. Because then you take more risks and you play maybe a champion you shouldn't play or a matchup you shouldn't play. So I'm very worried for games like the Schalke game where you don't know um, what mindset your team is going to be in, especially now that it's on a Saturday as well. Because then imagine you win against Misfits, everyone feels great, you're on top of yeah. the league, and then Schalke needs every win they can get at this point, right? Yeah, to they're make playoffs. So and they're, they're going to go bust out. Bust out the Heimer or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to go all out for that game. So we need to be ready for that. And I think. Yeah, it's a scary game if you're not ready. Yeah. Sweet. Honestly, I'm just uh, once again just excited to be back, excited to cast more League of Legends um, and ready to see kind of what Fnatic does, especially with the after the talk you had last week on PGL kind of talking about like, hey, getting the nerves together, keeping everybody focused. I, I want to see that that development. Um, but turning our attention to, to you, Shox talks about it on PGL. If you guys haven't watched that one, watch it already. Um, a lot about the motivation, what keeps you going. But rather than talk about motivation, we thought we'd talk a little bit about your history today because you are, I guess, probably the most historic player in our league now at this point. Yeah, yeah. I think with, with Soaz um, piecing out. That's crazy to me. Wow. Well, so first off, how do you feel about being like uh, historic man? I know you're not, I don't think you're the oldest, but you are like the most veteran player in the league. How does that, how does that feel? Mm. Not sure. I haven't never thought about it like that. <laughs> uh, I guess in a way, I try these days to use my experience to my advantage more than I used to. I uh, I feel like I'm like able to see more clearly now than I than than before. So, for example, I think like we just talked about with the like uh, games you're supposed to win feeling harder than games you're not yeah. supposed to win uh, is something I never thought about before. But over the years, I've realized that like your mindset and what's in your head actually matters a lot more than what you're able to type out on your keyboard or do with your mouse. So uh, I feel like the experience has helped me a lot to become um, more stable, I would say, mm. in terms of these games on stage, because before I'd sometimes like go crazy in a game and the next day I'd just run it down. So I feel like it uh, it helps me a lot to be like that experience or like that most historic player, but at the same time, it's not something I think about every day. Yeah. It's, uh, it's also a, a thing I actually try to go away from as much as I can because I don't want to become a player where I just always say um, I have done so much already so I don't have to like put in the effort or put in the extra work. I can just rely on that because then I feel like I'm going down a very slippery slope and I would rather just be like this constant hardworking player. Yeah, I respect that mentality. Um, when you, how does this like... How does this compare to when you when you first joined the league? Because like you had a very, it's like it's hard to describe. I guess kind of meteoric rise almost, mm -hmm. right? Because you went from like nothing to not nothing, but to like pretty quickly just to fanatic stardom. Yep. You were like hit, you hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. So is that is that mentality something that you've kept over the years, or when you started out was it like a very very different story? Mm, I think it was a very different story. Back then I was almost so motivated that I forgot to like sleep at night. So it was uh, quite easy to be a pro player back then, I feel like, because it's a lot about putting in the putting in the hours and, you know, being, uh, how would you say, like uh, f all out for like yeah. being a pro player. It's it's hard to have like a, 
a thing on the side or to live like a normal life or whatever you would want to say. Mm -hmm. um, so back when I was so motivated, it was like really easy to be a pro player. And that kind of lasted for, um, I would say up until 2016. And then yeah. 2016, that's when like reality struck a little bit. And I realized that I'm in a foreign country, don't really know anyone. I'm working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's kind of like putting an extra stress on my body and my mind that I might not be able to cope with for too many years. So it's like, I had that transition year, which mm -hmm. I think I handled okay, not great. I mean, we weren't like a good team by any means. I wasn't helping for sure. I was trying to figure out who I was as a player and as a person. Um, but I also think it was like a very needed year for me because I couldn't always rely on like being this overly motivated yeah. person and player. So it was nice to have like a bit of a reality check when I realized like I actually have to also, you know, see life clearly and realize that sleep is important, eating is important. Maybe I don't need to work 16 hours every day. If I'd work 14 and do a little bit more efficient, then it's better. And if I spend some more time with my team, that will help me out in the long run as well. So it's like a lot of things came to mind yeah. in 2016. But before then, I was also like just playing. <laughs> I was just playing back then. I'm, I'm really curious because I think a lot of the things that you've said and like in everything, like in PGL and so forth, even now, it seems as if you've had like a really, really long term plan in mind. Mm. Has this been like when you were playing like Joint Fanatic, Meteoric Rise? I guess at the time it was just what's in front of you. Yep. And then at what point did you like think long term, or you do you even think long term? Like how how do you view? Mm. Like would you did you imagine yourself being here today? Like let's say five years ago? Mm, not really. No. On Euphoria? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> here at the pinnacle. So I think uh, the first time I had like an actual long term goal was when we made semifinals in 2015 Worlds. That's when I thought to myself like I want to win Worlds mm. one day. So that's been like the goal every year ever since. Yeah. Um, but as I said, it was like really easy in the first, I guess, 2012, 13, 14, 15 to just not think about anything and just play the game. I never thought about, as I said, like sleeping, eating, mm. talking to my teammates, how many hours I was working and how efficient I was working. It was just like, I wake up, I want to play games. Yeah. And at some point it was very late and I should probably go to sleep. So um, that kind of changed in 2016. That's when I also had this goal of, in mind where I want to win Worlds. And then we had a tough year, so I, I thought to myself, like, I probably have to change a couple of things to actually be able to reach the goal. And then ever since, it's been, like, steadily better, I would say. Like, 2017 was okay, not great. I had, like, moments of brilliance, but I also had very moments of int. So yeah. um, it kind of, like, led me into 2018. I was even better. 2019 was tough once again, but it also had us with, like, a fresh start. Mm -hmm. So I think now in 2020, it's, like, a very 2018 feeling where we had the gap year, like the 2017 year, where yeah. we had a new roster. We need to like work together, figure out how to work together. And then 2018 came around. We just swapped one member, won everything. And now 2020 is the same. We swapped one member. So are we going to win everything or what's the next play? I'm curious um, a lot about kind of this 2016 mentality shift. And, I, and I'm wondering like, kind of a chicken or the egg question, like what came first? Was it that, was it that you were struggling in 2016? Like so much as a team that made you like step back and look at your life and look at that perspective? Or did this like epiphany come separate from the team's performance? Was this before you really even started playing mm. in 2016? Because you talk about 2015 being like, you're like, we can do it. We yeah. can win world. So it feels like 2015 ends on this high note. And I can imagine that momentum could just carry through. So do you um, remember like what actually caused it? It didn't carry through. It didn't carry no, through? <laughs> uh, it carried through until people left the team. Like uh, when you ran over and, and Yellow left the team. And after that, I... I was very confused of what, on what to do because I was so used to playing with Yellow, for example, in bot lanes. So I was very confused on what I wanted to do with like another bot lane partner. And uh, it all kind of came out of nowhere as well. So I wasn't really ready for like new teammates and all that. So I guess I had a very like shocking moment in my career. And I thought to myself, like, this is going to be a very different year. I have to be like the shot caller now. That's when shot caller was a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everyone was like, someone has to make, yeah, someone all, the has to make all the calls. So I, uh, Daylor tried to mold me into being that guy. And it was like a lot of new things at once. And I wasn't even like actually thinking about how the team was doing. It was a lot about myself, mm. which now I kind of regret because I realize now that it's like all about the team. Actually, it's not so much about yourself. Um, but back then I was so, so focused on like being the shot caller, uh, being the main carry, you know, being like the face of the team. Cause it was always someone else doing all of these things. And I was always like kind of a background player, I guess, where I would be like the second carry or the third, mm -hmm. never have the shot call, never have to be the leader of the team or like the face of the team. I just had to like do my job 
and then that would be good enough. So it's a very different year, and I had to kind of like go out of my comfort zone a bit. Yeah. And that's when I think I realized that like, oh, I'm not actually as great as I think I am, or as people think I am. So it was like a a thing outside of the team, I would say, or like outside of our circles. That's that's I mean, just sounds like overall an incredibly intense year. Um, I'm curious now a little bit how your role and your perspective, you kind of talked already how it's developed. I'm curious like where where you've ended up, Mm -hmm. right? Like, are you the guy who's worried about being the leader maybe for the team, maybe less as an individual? How do you view kind of your role on this Fnatic lineup in 2020? How has that kind of shifted? Because it feels like you've said a lot how you've, gone through all of this and you kind of figured out more who you are, what you need as a person, as a player, what you provide. So like, mm. where's where's that ended up for you? So I think after 2016, I kind of realized in 2017 that I should stop trying to be like what everyone else wants me to be yeah. or whatever people think is the right thing to be. I kind of just realized that I should just be myself and try to do what I'm good at or like what I feel like I'm good at. So that's when the whole Canon thing started and the Twitch thing and the Tristana thing where everyone was playing like Caitlyn and Ash, I feel like. <laughs> and I was just doing my own thing, um, split pushing and obviously it was a bit over the top. Like I should never probably have put, pushed it that far, but the idea was there that I I realized I just should be myself and never like try to be someone I'm not. And that's why I don't think I'm like the face of the team anymore. People might see me as the face of the team because I've been here the longest, but I'm not. I've not. I'm not, and I've never really been a leader, in a way. I mean, I lead by example. I feel like, but I never lead by. Uh, yeah, you don't make grandiose. Like, yeah, I don't. I don't whatever. have like speeches, and I don't have uh, like this shot calling moments or whatever people back in the day thought would be like the leader. Uh, qualities. Yeah, the I, season three high. Whatever. I, if anything, don't talk as much as probably people would want me to talk. But I've realized, just as I realized in 2017, how I want to be as a player, also how I want to like communicate in game. I've never felt that comfortable playing and communicating at the same time. It's like my brain is on on too high energy. So I, I try to like talk when I'm, for example, walking out of base or in between games or after games or before games. So I make sure I get everything out. Mm-hmm. But then when I'm actually playing. I know that I perform better if I'm not talking, so I don't talk as much as I probably should, but it's like, it's all something I've thought about. It's not something that just happens, it's something I've thought about and something I've tried to like listen to myself a little bit with so I, I know what I feel comfortable doing. So nowadays I feel like I'm very much a player that uh, like I, I should be, if that makes sense. I have over the years realized like who I am mm-hmm. and then I've now like kind of just become that fully. I think that makes... I think in the AD carry position role specifically, I think it makes a lot of sense. Because mm. I think, like, at least from personal experience, like I went from playing, uh, like back in season three, I went from top to AD carry. Mm. And I realized how I just couldn't pay attention at all to anything that was going on mm. in comparison and contrast. And this might not be the best example, but always with players that I've worked with as well, it's always been like the same case. And uh, trying to push the AD carry in that direction, I feel like it's almost counterintuitive because mm. it's like the expression of how good an AD carry is is always in how good you execute mechanically. And I think um, it's it's amazing to hear you say this because I think it is insane. Like we have veterans that have stuck around, but I think what's what's really, really insane is that you are, I feel like even 2019, I think individually, I think watching it was really, really insane. So, you know, and looking back at the fact that, you know, coming into 2020, it continues in the same regard. It is definitely paints a picture. It uh, coincides with what you're saying. So it's really insane to hear. Yeah. I'm curious if it was difficult to like accept who you were, who you are, who you see yourself to be. Because, like, yeah, yeah, because like I think everyone wants to be, you know, the best at everything. And so like, how do you, how did you like let go of the idea that you want, like that you needed to be the shot caller, that you needed to be like the guy leading the team? Because while that is a huge burden, it's also like, I don't know, I I feel like it would make me feel like powerful, like, hey, I'm the best, I can do this. Like it's a big challenge. And in the way that you're competitive with winning the league, it kind of make me, I think, feel competitive in the sense that I just want to be like the best Mm. at everything, not just like winner of the EU LCS or LEC or whatever. So I got to that point through therapy sessions, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's back. I tweeted a little bit about this when I was actually like in the worst possible state of mind. But mm. 
Uh, this was back in 2017, so the year where I started realizing that I can't be the shot caller, I can't be the leader, and I had a lot of struggles finding out who then I wanted to be. So mm -hmm. that's when I, I started with the therapy sessions and realized that I should just be myself. So it's a bit deeper than just like I had the epiphany myself, but like yeah. uh, that year was like uh, the year where I did all of these struggles so that I, I could really like dive into myself later on in my career. And uh, dude, honestly, like, thank you for sharing that. Like, I think that, I mean, I go to therapy actively, but I think a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't have immediately shared that. So thank mm. you. Um, and that's honestly really cool, dude. Uh, I think that like that was transition and that growth, I think, and this is going to get like very outside of the world of League of Legends, but I feel like every two years from like 18, you've conv you're convinced you've figured yourself out. Like at 20, I was convinced I figured myself out. Mm. 22, I was like, oh, I was wrong at 20, but now 22-year-old me has got it all figured out in 24. And I feel like that's where outside perspective always really helps to like kind of keep you grounded. Yep. Um, I'm curious, like how much of your time now then are you spending like thinking consciously about mental health? Like, do you, I don't know if like mindfulness or every if it's day. like meditation. Yeah, every, every day. day yeah. Damn. I've realized that like, I play at my best when my state of mind is good. It's not when I put in like the most hours possible. It's always when I feel comfortable, um, team is going good, like the feeling or the atmosphere of the team is good. That's when I play at my best. So I've realized now that like I should put a lot more effort into my state of mind and the team state of mind and not just the hours I spend in front of the PC. That seems like an infinitely more difficult challenge though than just grinding more. It is right. Yeah. Do you feel? Do you feel like right now that you're equipped? That you have the answers? That you've kind of, not to like pathologize everything, but like you you figure yourself out enough that like you know what you need to do to get into that good head state consistently. Or do you feel like sometimes it's sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. It's a much more. Uh, it's experience. it's always going up and down. I don't think it will ever be like a perfect situation, or I don't think I'll be, ever be a perfect human being by any means. Yeah. It's just uh, some weeks are better. And then I try to appreciate that those weeks are really good mm. and some weeks are harder. And then I try to appreciate that like a small thing can still be a lot or like mean a lot. Or I, I try to just focus on like, yeah, as I said, just small things all the time. And also realize that like, it's, it's fine that it's hard. It's not always gonna be perfect or it's always not always gonna be great. So I'm okay with like hard weeks. And I had like two weeks, I think this split already where I was like in a really bad state of mind. And I feel like I dragged my team down with it, but Nowadays, I also feel like I'm mature enough to then say it to my team. Yeah. And I, I, did, I did, like I said, uh, sorry for the games. I haven't been feeling too well. So it's not like I tried to hide it anywhere. And I feel like that actually helps my team too, because then if I take responsibility for the games or like I take responsibility for my actions during those two weeks, then people feel better about those two weeks. Because if no one says anything and you just perform pretty badly on stage, which I did, I think it was like three, three games straight, I played pretty poorly, then it can become like a very toxic environment where everyone's trying to point fingers, but then if I just point it at myself instead, it's all good. So yeah. it's it's always like every split I have at least a couple of weeks where it's like really tough. But nowadays I just try to like appreciate the weeks where it's not tough and still like kind of just think about small things when it's when it's tough. It can be anything from like um, going to the gym or yeah. spending an evening playing boarding, board games or something with your mm -hmm. teammates, like very small things just to get you through those weeks. That's... I don't want to get too preachy, but to anyone watching this, these are admirable human qualities. And if you're wondering what you should do, being aware of yourself, taking accountability for your actions, holy crap, you're a better human being than I am, dude. What the no, it's hell? It's not about that. I know, I know it's not about that. I know it's not a contest. It's just I'm always scared that like when I play poorly on stage that my team feels like um, I'm thinking it's because of them or yeah. Um, no one really knows whose fault it was, so they start like pointing fingers on someone else. It's like, I, I just prefer a situation where I play poorly and I say it to my team, I played poorly, it's my bad, you know? Yeah. That's... And, uh, it's especially worse than when it's like we one of the games, out of these three games were against G2. Yeah. Uh, it was, I think, G2, Vitality, and um, Mad Lions. Those were the three games, like mm -hmm. they were they were back to back and those two weeks I was not in like a good state of mind at all. Um, and I just feel much better if I then say, mm. these two weeks I, I had a bad state of mind, I didn't play well. So others can feel better about themselves too, because in the long run, it's like, I will earn from that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like an investment, but it's like, it's more, I don't want them to like go to bed at night thinking, what am I doing wrong? 
yeah. I'm playing the maximum I can. I have a good mood. Like, why why is this not working? It's just easier than if I just take the responsibility. I think it's it's funny that you say that you're not a leader, you know, because this is this is a leadership, right? Yeah, it's just not the kind of leader that I think people in 2016 like flag, wanted me to know? be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Because I think people in 2016 wanted me to be yellow star, basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, can I, never we did. I, I was there. We did. That's exactly yeah. what people wanted. We wanted you to step yeah. up. We wanted you to be the shot caller. And I think that was probably an unfair burden, but I think it's the nature of when other greats leave, you look at the next person in line to just yeah. take the place, right? Regardless yeah. of who they are. Should have been Kleibak <laughs> or Noxiak <laughs> or just Spirit. Spirit shot called. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I remember the Rosa too well. Yeah. So do I. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... It's really fantastic to hear like how that development has been. And I'd be curious like if there are more pros out there that are willing to speak as openly about this, what their position has been like. Because this feels very unique to me, right? Uh, and a part of it is I think that you're just willing to be open about it. But I'm curious like, because there are a lot of other people that have grown up as pro players. Not None of them have spent as much time as you have, but like what their perspective is and how their perspective changed. And if they're... Um, because there's also just going to be different people. Like I'm sure there are some people who are still just content to grind 12 hours a day and that level of mindfulness is just not as necessary for them. But yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, we're going to go to a quick break. But when we come back, the most influential people over the years for Reckless's career and more on Reckless's history, what's been happening, everything in his life after this. For a long time now, tank players have been very sad. Suffering through champions like Gangplank. Ugh. Aurelia. Gross. Worst of them all, Aatrox. But fear not, my tank playing friends. The time for your bad hands and big brains has come again. Introducing Orn. Want to take a million tower shots and go completely unpunished? Orn. Need to solo kill a champion who has infinitely more gold than you while building no damage items whatsoever? Orn. Need to belittle your allies for poor itemization choices while clearly just abusing an OP champion? Orn. Over the past four patches, Orn has been on the rise, and with the most recent buffs to Sunfire Cape, there has never been a better time to play Orn. Play Orn today. Also, please, for the love of God, nerf this champion. Welcome back. Uh, discussion with Reckless continuing today. Um, looking towards kind of our next subtopic in this huge discussion, wanted to get your gauge on kind of the most influential people over the years, because you've obviously changed a lot. We talked a ton about your growth, what that looks like, who you are today, but um, kind of want to look at some of the names that have either helped you get there, people that have been, you know, shining lights or people that you've probably don't want to badmouth these people, but there might be people you just didn't want to end up like, you don't have to say those names, but there might be some of those too. Um, so yeah, I was curious if anything immediately jumps to your mind when I, when I say that, like people who've had the biggest influence on molding you, whether it's personally, as a player, just in general. So... The first thing that came to mind to me was parents and sister. Mm. I feel like even nowadays when I'm playing pro, they're still like the closest people I have. So whenever I take inspiration from somewhere or I need advice or I just need to vent, they are the ones that are there for me. So I would say those are like the most influential people in my life. But if it comes to the pro scene, then I would say probably my earliest years of playing, specifically the teams where I've always felt like we were friends over colleagues. So that would be mostly the 2014 roster and the 2015 one, I would say. Uh, specifically, I would say probably XPeke. Actually, all four of them in that roster, XPeke, so Signet and Yellow, were all like very influential, I would say, on my career. Mm. And then 2015, even though Huni, Reynor, and Fabian or Febiven were like um, not as influential, they were still showing me that it was okay to be like a bit younger. If that makes sense, because when I started playing with like uh, the 2014 roster, they were all, yeah, they were I guess, grown. a bit, yeah, they're they're around. All <laughs> a bit like I am now. <laughs> so, in a way, I felt like it was um, not okay to be like 17 and super excited about League of Legends. Yeah, they were all kind of jaded, and you kind of just felt like, hey, yeah. that's those are the people that I like, these are the people I play with, so I'm going to be like them too. Yeah. yeah, so I tried really hard to become one of them. Mm. Um, but then when I played in the 2015 roster with Huni Raynor and Febivin, I realized that it's actually okay to be like 17 and super excited about League of Legends. So <laughs> that helped me a lot too, to be more content with myself and not so focused all the time at becoming someone else. Dang. I remember that year, 2014, because I think spring you got MVP, right? Uh, 
so I had, I think I had MVP in summer playoffs and spring in general. Because I remember summer was was rough for you guys. Yeah, I remember you guys were like really in the bottom, and then like, then there was like a super week, and I think you guys four old, and mm-hmm. then it was the 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 finals versus Alliance with the Alistar meta. Mm-hmm. I remember it so vividly because I was casting that in Swedish. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, good times. <laughs> Now you can't. Now maybe we'll get you casting in English, analyst desking in English. Who knows? Have to find out. Um, <laughs> wow. I, yeah, I guess it didn't really occur to me that like it makes a lot of sense, but it didn't occur to me that that the like enjoying league and kind of being a kid would have been much harder for you as being like the sole, the young guy, kind mm-hmm. of like coming. To Don't get me wrong; they enjoyed league too. Yeah, it's just yeah, a very it's... different kind of way of enjoying league when you're a little bit older and you've done it for a couple of years versus your like first pro year. Because Rahuni, Rainover, and Febim, it was all their first like pro yeah. pro year. So yeah. they all played a little bit, I think. Maybe not Huni, but I think Rainover had some some stints in LCK and Febivan had Game over. Uh, game over. Yeah. yeah and and Febivan had in uh in Academy like here in Europe. Yeah. So they all had experience, but never at, you know the, the big leagues. Yeah, the big leagues. So yeah. it was just like a very different way of enjoying league, and it made me feel a lot better about myself because I was one of those guys in, in those years that like really, really enjoyed League of Legends. Mm. I still do. It's just different now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, because I've, I, I've seen a lot of like pro players grow up. Right. It's like one of the the cool things about casting this league for so long. And definitely, there's a difference between when you join the league and you're in that 16 hours of solo queue a day. Yeah. All you want to do is play league and talk about league to like building a little bit more of a balance, yeah. appreciating different things from just grinding solo queue games, enjoying more of the team player strategy. Like I think it is a big shift as people enter the league, kind of stepping away from the. Yeah, 16 hours a day of grinding, which always blows my mind. Shout out to anyone who can play that much League of Legends. That's intense. Um, Yamato, hmm. didn't you play with Reckless for a while? Yeah. Uh, it's, is, isn't it, it's a very proud moment. I've been telling his story <laughs> many times. I think every time we run into each other, you know, at, uh, <laughs> the occasional after party, after some finals or something, where we sit in the corner and talk in Swedish. <laughs> as, uh, it, was, it was interesting because I remember already back then, uh, like this was season two, season one. Yeah. And I remember back then it was uh, like my memory of you was that like the, the rumor was always that you were like jumping around to team to team, mm-hmm. but you did for a really good reason because there were some teams that's like they just slowed down. Like all of a sudden, like you were in a team and then like two guys just stopped showing up and it was like that was it, you know? But I knew that it, it always felt like you had a bigger agenda because mm-hmm. you were always, always moving forward and there were people that were like standing still. And I think this was like a, this I feel like reflected on where where it got you, you know, eventually to that fanatic point, mm. the IPL and all. And then I remember the story of you, uh, like the guys, you guys boot camped in your hometown, right? Yeah. You went to school and then you went to yeah. to, to the internet cafe. Like this is crazy stuff. Wait, can you can you explain that story? Because I've actually <laughs> never heard that story. That's actually insane. I had no idea so, what uh, happened. <laughs> as you said, I was like jumping around teams quite a lot back then because also back then you didn't have contracts yeah. that like yeah put you in a specific team it was much more about Playing who was ducks. available and who wasn't <laughs> available so you just played with whichever team needed an AD carry basically or in my case needed an AD carry um, and that later then uh, led me to Fnatic because I think um, it was called Lamia I think he like mm-hmm. retired after yeah. the yeah. world championship qualifiers that year and there were some tournaments at the end of the year which I knew Fnatic wanted to play but they didn't have an AD carry for it so obviously I lended a hand it was like a good way in did for you, me did you like did you show up I reached out yeah you re- I reached out to Peke and asked if he oh, wanted yeah. to uh, or if they wanted to play DreamHack with me because I was going there anyways with my friends oh. it's like an hour or an hour and a half from my from my hometown so so you invited them to your team yo that's a hustle <laughs> that's, <laughs> a, that's a <laughs> hustle I respect that you're yeah. like yo Peke I just happened to be here I couldn't help but notice your AD carry's missing and I hope you couldn't help but notice but I'm a prodigy so it's perfect <laughs> yeah. like DreamHack yeah. close to home you don't have to explain yeah. to the parents <laughs> exactly I, I, I just said actually I'm going to DreamHack and then I, they obviously knew that I was playing the tournament as well, but they I don't think they knew to what extent yeah. I was playing the tournament. Uh, they they figured it out, though, because uh, up to this dream hack, uh, the team wanted to boot camp for a week in uh, Yunshoping, which yeah. is the, the city of uh, dream hack. Mm-hmm. And I was going to school at this time, so I had to get like a, like a, on paper that I could take a week off, and yeah. that obviously then alerted my parents a little bit that something was going on, but they were okay with it because it was still 
just a week for them. So I went a week then to bootcamp in, in Jönköping with the team, played Remac, it did really well, we did really well. So then they wanted to keep me around for the next couple of tournaments as well. And the one after that was IPL5. And that was like one and a half week, I think, after Remac. Mm -hmm. And they obviously didn't want to like go somewhere else because yeah. they were already in Sweden at that point. So they went to Gothenburg together with me <laughs> and uh, got an Airbnb and a place at an internet cafe. And I was still going to school at this time. So I, I would then stay with them at Airbnb, but wake up like at 6 a.m., go to school. <laughs> and then they, they would sleep in all day. And then we'd meet up after I was done with school and go to the internet cafe together and play all night. So I would sleep like one or two hours every night back then. Uh, and do everything at once. It was very, very complex now that you think back at yeah. it. But yeah. back then I was so driven by everything. So one, and I, one or two hours of sleep every night for playing together with this team at an internet cafe and having so much fun together it was like i couldn't even think twice about it you know it was like i'm also all out for it though. it honestly like makes that. me miss kind of the early days of esports because i think that the like you definitely while the the path to pro is much clearer and i'm happy for that and i think it's much easier for people to rise up and to be noticed and i think that is a good thing i think it makes some of the stories less cool because you hear a lot more of the same story and a lot less of these weird stories because i didn't know i thought they found you i didn't know you just like showed up and like were like hey i'm <laughs> imagine here. if you did that's, right man that's, that's crazy, dope man. that's so cool um our story is pretty crazy too like we had a support yeah and uh she was uh pretended to be a girl and well I don't know if she was a girl or not and and she was together with a jungler but they never met and then all of a sudden like someone on Twitter yeah just said you you stole all these pictures from this person I know this person oh. you stole these pictures Your and support was catfishing people she catfished and, and then we she just she just person. disappeared mm -hmm. she just disappeared off Skype she just disappeared like we played with her like I played with her for maybe half a year and then she just disappeared it was really strange that was our, that story. The early days of the internet. Early dude. days of the internet. Who did we get after that? I don't even remember. I think you went to Fanatic or something. Because like, oh, you, <laughs> you I was playing with her stars. too. But I, I think I was also playing with someone else after she left. I think we had... Because uh, Taps was playing mid, wasn't he? Back then? I think we had Taps mid in that team, actually. Wow. Yeah. Those were the days. <laughs> yeah, it's so <laughs> weird how days. many of these yeah. names have just been around or like existed. Yeah. And then it's like Bjergsen. <laughs> Were you around when Bjergsen was in the team? Uh, no, I wasn't. Yeah, because he was before my time, I think. Even. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. I just the only thing that makes <laughs> that makes me laugh is that there's like there's two versions of of these like old school names. There's the people who stuck around, eventually made it to like pro play in some capacity and like did something more or less right and then there's the people who like got banned or completely disappeared and those are also my favorite stories like the great banning of incarnation and darkwing jacks and like whoever else and like team solo mebd <laughs> team solo mebd <laughs> like all these names who just who just absolutely disappeared it's ripping up old scars here jacob <laughs> i'm sorry dude your entire team got banned <laughs> out from under you nothing yeah, good you times done. Uh, you mentioned before we kind of just got into this rant about early esports, which I do always love that like your parents are really influential, right? And I think that that's probably true for a lot of people, but I'm curious um, how your parents felt about initial pro play. They signed, it was only a week, it seemed like things were going well, and obviously things are good now, mm. but I, was it always like so smooth sailing? No, it wasn't. Yeah? Um, they always wanted me to prioritize school and... Uh sports or i guess at the time when i had the knee injury it was rehabilitation mm -hmm. is that how you say it in english yeah um so they always allowed me to play but it was after i was done with my other duties if that makes sense so for the most part it was fine but then when it came to like traveling around potentially moving to cologne at the time yeah it was a very different question and it took them a while to get get on board but um we made like an agreement back then that i would finish my first year of gymnasium mm -hmm. i'm not sure what the global uh, translation of gymnasium in Sweden the is the first year of, of high school. I guess it's high school, yeah. yeah. Um, after the first year, I would take a break, one year break, not more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Wait, go how old pro. were you when you entered gymnasium? Um, I was about to turn seventeen, so I was sixteen. Oh, okay. That's weird. Yeah, the equivalent in American would be like your third year of high school, but I guess mm -hmm. it's just different education systems. Okay. Because I I was sixteen and then I finished my first year mm -hmm. and they allowed me one year break so I went down to Cologne waited to turn seventeen and then I played together with Fnatic mm -hmm. for the twenty fourteen season and then I was supposed to go back to school but then we did really well and they were like they were all out for esports at that point so it was okay but <laughs> in a world where perhaps we didn't do as well I would have probably gone back to school after one year but mm -hmm. it turned out really really good for me 
and they were there to see some of the games and I, I think got like a vibe of esports and probably liked it. So they were okay with me like taking a couple of more years. And now I'm like seven or eight years later, so school is not happening. <laughs> Did your mom ever bring it up? Like, so have you considered going back to school? Uh, we never got to that point, but we have talked a bit about how I would study if I were to study again, because yeah. in Sweden I can't do gymnasium anymore. I'm too old. So I would have to do something called Kombux, which yeah. is like, uh, I think it's a school for people who need to adults, like, yeah. yeah, for adults basically, yeah, who need to do some specific courses to get into university. Yeah. So I would have to do basically every course to get into university, but there are options for me if I wanted to study again. Dang. Would you want to study ever? Like you could just work in esports, no? Um, not sure. I have not that many plans for when I'm done. They kind of change from time Slightly to time. Changed. I still have like, I, I have traveling still. I feel like I, I talked about that last time I was here too. Uh, but now I also have doing military service. Okay. So okay. I have those two right now for when I'm done playing. But then I also want to coach. I would like to do like the French guy who won the World Cup in football as a player. And then he won it in 2018 now as a coach. Okay. I think it was 2018, right? The World Cup in football. Yeah. I think it was. So he won it as a player and as a coach. And I would like to be like the, the League of Legends equivalent of that okay. to win it as a player and then win it as a coach. But yeah, other than that, I don't really have that many plans. So it could end up happening that I study again. But at the same time, I don't know when I'm winning Worlds. I don't know how long it will take for me to win worlds as a coach, so maybe I'm, I'm done with life at that point. Dude, we'll get there one step at yeah. a time. One step at a time. That's that's fair. Um, how often do you actually think about the future like that, though? How often do you look that far ahead? Because it's like not from, often. Not often. It was a part of my my time in 2017 when I was trying to figure out my life and mm -hmm. who I wanted to be, and I realized that I'm pretty bad at um, focusing in the present. I'm yeah. a very easy drift off drift off in the future or dwell too much in the past so i try really hard nowadays to just like take one step at a time and not be yeah. so so focused on everything else I, I'm, I'm curious because I, I always come across two different people do you ever like like for example when you've won a split in the past mm -hmm. for how long do you celebrate like when how, how, how long until like the next thing um before I would not celebrate at all, actually. Yeah. But nowadays, I think I'd celebrate at least one night. Yeah. But uh, when I won, for example, in Copenhagen, I didn't celebrate at all. I went home at 6 a.m. the morning after together with my family. Mm. So there was no celebration there. Uh, Madrid, same thing. We went to Korea the morning after to boot camp for Worlds. This one's 2018, both of them. Um, 2015, no celebration. We went to Korea as well back then when we won yeah, in yeah. Stockholm. And 2014, when I won, I think I went home actually. This was before All Stars, which was like MSI of 2014, uh, which was held in Paris. I remember I went home and we didn't practice at all. And then we went there and got absolutely destroyed by pretty much every team. I think we only won one game against TPA back mm -hmm. then. So yeah. uh, I've never had like a point where I've been celebrating, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, everyone celebrates in their own way. It's not always a party or anything yeah. like that. But I don't think I've ever given me uh, given myself the time of day to just be like content with everything. And I think that's a, a bit, bit sore, of who I am, mm -hmm. but also a bit of my past like extreme behaviors. Mm -hmm. I feel like nowadays I'll be more okay with taking like a day off to celebrate. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that just feels really tough. I think that's kind of the nature of like people who are incredibly ambitious in my experience. And maybe this is what kind of what you were alluding to is that just, yeah, I don't think I think the people that really just want to be the best at something or win or just want to keep accomplishing more, I think it's really hard to slow down yeah. and to be like, it's okay for me to just stop and enjoy this moment and celebrate this for what it is rather than being like, okay, Worlds, okay, next season, okay, next tournament, okay, next whatever. I kind of uh, regret it though because I feel like it would make the memory more uh, sweet if I, I actually gave myself... If you treated it yeah, like you want something exactly. instead of treating it like it was just another step. Yeah, because step. if I if I don't do anything, then obviously I remember like the games and I remember the feeling of standing there and lifting the trophy, but it ends there. That's yeah. that's the end of it. And I would like it to be more special than that. Obviously, it's very special already, but yeah. I think the more special I can make it, I should, because then when I'm old and I sit on my porch, I can think back and have like yeah. more fond memories of that yeah. specific day. I think it's just super common, right? I think... It's like this this addiction of always moving forward. I think it's so common in, in the highest level of esports. It's like it was crazy. Like Doinbi 
right after he won Worlds, he's like, yeah, I'm going to win Worlds again. I'm not retiring. I'm going for Worlds again. Otherwise, I'm not happy. We need to go Grand Slam. It's like, okay. Mm-hmm. It's been one day, dude. <laughs> and it's so common. Like, I even remember, like, Michael Jordan was inducted to the Hall of Fame and he was crowned, like, the best player of all time. And as he's t- doing his speech, he's, like, addressing haters that didn't believe in him. It's like, dude, you are the best. It's like, everyone agrees. <laughs> Calm down. And, and even that moment, he struggles, you know, or fought against it. Which I think it's like it's a part of uh, uh, the the drive, I guess. But I mm. think it's important to also learn how to appreciate things. I think it's hard because even just like in a caster sense, which is a much less informed uh, ambition. But like for people who don't know, it is a competitive job. Like if me and Yamato are both color casters, we're competing for that spot on the world final. There is like that drive, right? Like where I like the best I've ever done last year was a world semifinal cast, and I was super happy about that. But like mm. I got that. And all I thought was, I got to get that final. Mm. I got to get that final. So I know that feeling. It's really intense. And it does it does kind of suck when you can't stop and appreciate it. And sometimes it is hard to just to kind of take a step back. Um, but um, speaking of the haters, Yamato. Reckless, I'm, I'm curious. Well, the haters. Where yes. Are you going with this? Yeah, you're ready. Gonna be, <laughs> no, um, I'm curious, Reckless, like how you've handled the public eye and how that's adjusted for you is kind of like one more thing before we wrap up for the day. Because... Um, I, every player, it feels like when they start, at least back in the early days, it's like instant, like so much attention. You instantly go from like the kid playing at home to so many people talking to you, so many people paying attention to what you're doing. I was curious how how you adjusted to that and like how your philosophy on like social media and engaging with the public and interviews and even like podcasts like this has like changed over the years. So in the beginning, I was like you said, I was very much taking everything in and maybe pushing it a little bit too much. If anything, I kind of regret doing that because it set a tone for who I who I was um, publicly, mm. which was not who I was privately. So I, I kind of had to like slow down over the years and then people took that the wrong way. Um, but then obviously I've been like very extreme now towards the later years where I barely do nothing, um, which is not really related to uh, doing too much in the beginning. It was more like I got a really bad or I had actually a lot of bad experiences with social media, so I kind of wanted to step away from it as much as I could. Obviously, I try to still stream sometimes or do these things sometimes because I know then I can kind of like not control the outcome, but still speak up in a way I kind of want to speak up. Mm-hmm. Uh, meanwhile, for example, doing a tweet or something can get very easily like misinterpreted. Yeah. And I also don't want to get into these wars with on Twitter with people that call me out on like daily basis because I feel like that's just... Like playing their game. <laughs> yeah, I, I made that mistake once and I feel like that was enough for me. I, I realized after that that I don't want to be that guy. Because I know these days there are still people that want me to become, like they want to trigger me and want me to go in into the war. But I don't want to give them like that, that satisfaction. Yeah, that satisfaction. I just, just want to leave them like as the, as the people they are and want to remain the guy I am and then I'm good with that. But streaming and doing stuff like this is really something I like actually because then I feel like I can actually express myself mm. in the way I want to express myself and not just words on paper because that can yeah. so easily be misinterpreted. Oh, yeah. I mean, just anyone who's tried to have a com- text conversation is going to know. That's yeah. why it's the word I like. I was like grumpy old man and like early 2010s. I was like, emojis suck. But then I realized if you don't put the emoji at the end of the sentence, it can go very Psychopath. quickly from like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just it goes very quickly from like a positive statement to like, passive aggressive to whatever depending mm-hmm. on how you uh, the context that someone else reads it in i like making people think though i i think like in regards to the whole social media business I, i've run into so many players saying telling me like it doesn't affect me it doesn't affect me but i think uh like everyone has like a mental diet and i think right now in the era of social media we digest so much information and it's lodged somewhere in our mind it's just taking up space for no reason and i think Keeping our subconscious healthy is just as important as keeping everything else healthy. And I think just reading, like reading Reddit in general or anything, there's nothing to gain as a pro player. And I think people, I'm surprised not more people do it the same way you do. Super surprised. Well, I think it's just a negative stamp that that the way I do right now Mm. is like, it has a very negative stamp, I think. Mm. So people don't really want to join in because they don't want to become like, me who don't tweet as much or don't interact as much yeah because i feel like people don't see it as a positive thing like you do it's very rare actually that someone says it's a positive thing i've i think like 
might actually be the first time I hear someone say it. So I think you've nailed well, it because yeah. like you tweet once a month and it's like, holy shit, Reckless tweeted, you know, the whole world stops. It's like he's some fanatic merch <laughs> okay, or something, okay. you know. <laughs> it's uh, world just, I, can, I can imagine why. <laughs> it's like this enigma about it, it, you know. Yeah, I well, can just imagine why. To like to devil's advocate, right? Because like I'm I'm not the biggest fan. Now I love anyone who supports me. I appreciate you all, but social media is a difficult thing. Um, and I'm sure you feel the same way. Like fans are, are wonderful, but social media is really hard. But I think from a business standpoint, like brand size matters, right? And like from a from a fan side, they like want to engage with the people that they love and respect. But I do think on the flip side is that there is this theoretical world where you can engage with social media and take nothing positive and nothing negative. But then like, what's the point? And the other reality is, yeah, I hear so many people, pro players, casters, anyone really who's public facing tell me that like it doesn't affect them. But it's like if you're taking positive and you're taking praise, you're also going to be taking negative. You can't take well, you can't just disregard all the praise and take the positive. I just don't think that's how people work. So if you're if you're involved, if you're playing the game, to put it in weird terms, I guess, um, you're you're getting it all. You're getting the negative. You're getting the positive. And I think it's not it's not always worth it. And if your goal is to be the biggest brand and the biggest business, maybe you want players who are really good at engaging on social media. But if your goal is to be the best. I think you just want players who are healthy and happy. And I don't think social media is, for some people, it's fine for them. For others, it's not. And I think that's just the way that it is. Like, it can be super, super toxic. It can also be fun. It can be a good time. Yeah. Well, so I've basically tried to design a way where I don't get the positive, but I also don't get the negative. Yeah. So I have just a very, like, out. yeah, I have a very neutral basis, I guess, where I sometimes tweet, but I don't really read what people say. So I still get like a bit of the social media side, but not really the side that I don't want. So it's very similar actually to my transition in 2017 as a player in terms of how I do social media right now. It's like I, I do it my way, the way I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And obviously people are very unhappy about that <laughs> because they want me to do it like everyone else. Yeah. I'm being honest, I, did, I was sad and for five minutes when you unfollowed everyone on Twitter. I was like... I thought we were close. And then I was like, why the hell do I evaluate this as a measure of personal relationship? It's not, but I was a little sad. I get that. <laughs> but it's the, the yellow star syndrome for me yeah. once again, where I, I don't want to be like people want me to be. I want to be the person I myself want me mm. to be. And mm. I've always felt the most comfortable when I opt out of the positive and the negative, And I just do things that like give me a very neutral basis. Streaming is the, the worst, I guess, that I do. But then I also always run like sub mode. So if someone wants to pay to flame me, then five dollars yeah, well you know, spent, they, buddy. They pay to flame <laughs> me. But that has actually not really happened yet. It's always like the the people that want to interact with me through streaming are people that actually want to like like you or are at least yeah. you know nice enough to have a conversation rather than just trying to flame. So me. then it's not it's not even about being like having positive feedback. It's more just having like people that actually care about me hanging out with me. So it's mm. it's a very strict way of doing it but it's a way that i enjoy and i think that's all that matters in the end it's, you should do it the way you want to do it not yeah. the way everyone else wants you to do it that's cool i like it honestly um as like one final question unless you might you i'll give you the final question if you want it, but i got one if you don't okay you want to go? Go, go, go i was gonna say um i think that it's interesting watching the other interesting thing about watching pro players grow up is that you see kind of how they approach interviews change mm -hmm. You first come in, you're kind of nervous. And then I feel like there's like this two-year period where you've kind of got it figured out and you become super PR. And I feel like you've transcended past that. And you're just, it feels to me like very honest, very genuine answers. And I'm curious if like, if there's like a switch that flicked for you, if there's a moment where you decided to kind of change your approach to this and to speak more openly as opposed to just like, well, the team's doing well and things are going to go good and we respect our opponents, you know, and like kind of going more in depth on how you feel and why you feel that way. I think it was... Um or there was a point in my life where I cared a lot about what people thought about me. I wanted everyone to like me. And I was okay with people not loving me as long as they didn't hate me. Yeah. But nowadays I'm I'm content with people hating me because I know there's going to be the other side where people love me. So I just kind of stopped caring, I guess. it's it's. I'm not sure if it came with age <laughs> or if it came with experience. Yeah. But either way, at some point I stopped caring so much about what others think of me. And I started thinking more of what... I myself think of me or what the people I care about think of me. And then I realized I should just say what I have on my mind because that will get me further in life than if I if I hold back and I take too much of a neutral standpoint where I yeah. never hurt anyone, but I never help anyone either. Because yeah. I think it not only then reflects who I am as a, as a person, but also as a player. So it can like give me struggles in my team and it can give me struggles 
um, when I work, you know, with like staff members or something. So I just want to be like a very open person because then I know if there are issues, I will bring them up and I won't just let them be there. And if someone's doing well, I will always praise them. Like I will always just say what's on my mind. And I think that's really important and something that's uh, undervalued actually. And I mean, not only esports, I guess, just in general. Yeah. I, I prefer when people just say what they have on their mind, even mm -hmm. though it can be harsh sometimes. I would rather take that hit then and there yeah. to future, like in the future build on that relationship than have this like fake feeling towards each other. I think that's like more annoying. I uh, read this quote once uh, saying, a conversation is the pursuit of truth. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is the way to do it. I think everything that we do to be around the bush is just a waste of energy and time. It's efficient to just be honest. I agree. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna be honest, that's a perfect ending. So thank you, Reckless, so much for coming on the show, dude. Thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, it was, it was great. Um, Fanatic playing Misfits and Schalke this weekend. Check it out, LEC starting 5.30 p.m. Uh, on Friday is, of course, Ready Check. This has been Euphoria Episode 7. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>